New audiobooks on our channel for free every week. Subscribe and click on the bell to not miss. Preface Hideyoshi is the most remarkable and most unusual leader in the history of Japan. He was born in 1536 in a poor peasant family. Nothing seemed to foretell an amazing fate for him. Hideyoshi was small in stature, weak in build, uneducated and ugly. His protruding ears, deep-set eyes, puny body and red-wrinkled face made him look strikingly like a monkey, which explained the nickname Monkey, which stuck to him for life. Hide Yoshi was born at the height of the troubled age of clan struggle, when a military career or the priesthood for an ambitious peasant was the only way to avoid hard labor in the field. More than modest physical data, a height of one and a half meters, a weight of 50 kilograms and a strong stoop, did not promise him success in the military field. And yet he managed to soar, like a star, to the heights of leadership and unite a country torn apart by centuries of civil strife. How did he do it? Iron willpower, razor-sharp mind, unyielding perseverance and a subtle understanding of human psychology, these are the qualities that allowed Hideyoshi to turn skeptics into loyal servants, rivals of loyal friends, and enemies into allies. Not having reached special heights in the possession of martial arts, this samurai without a sword used another weapon. His self-deprecating humor, cunning and ability to negotiate helped him surpass his well-born rivals and become the ruler of Japan. In a hierarchical society where the inviolable laws of caste boundaries reigned, Hideyoshi became a hero of the outcasts, an example for everyone who longed to decide his own fate and aspired to rise, like the heroes of Horatio Alger, from dirt to princes. Note. Horatio Alger, American writer, author of numerous stories about the transformation of the poor into the rich. In 1590 Hideyoshi became the supreme ruler of the country. Having received the title of regent from Emperor Gaozi, he enjoyed the royal power. The imperial court honored him with the aristocratic surname Toyotami, which means generous minister. Historians have ambiguously assessed Hideyoshi's reign, but still his amazing achievements were overshadowed by failures. And the fame of this outstanding commander and statesman continued to grow even after his death in 1598. Hideyoshi's life was described and embellished in the detailed official biography of Taikoki, The Tale of Taiko, first published in 1625th year. Today, for centuries later, every Japanese schoolboy knows the name Hideyoshi. Countless biographies, novels, plays, movies and even video games are dedicated to him and his exploits. Samurai as exemplary leaders in the eyes of the modern reader, the figure of a samurai as a reference carrier of leadership qualities looks doubtful. By and large, the Japanese knights of the feudal era, with their clearly non-democratic leadership style and commitment to the principles of unquestioning obedience and selfless devotion to the master, can hardly serve as an example for modern business people. Samurai were glorified for their exploits on the battlefield, but not for their mastery of management technologies. For the most part, they were lousy businessmen, poorly versed in commerce and often became victims of unabashed deception in trade transactions. But it is for this reason that Hideyoshi's personality deserves our attention. Unlike other samurai, completely devoid of business acumen, Hideyoshi showed himself to be a skilled salesman. Against the background of rude and despotic colleagues, he looked like an egalitarian leader, a peasant who, thanks to the strength of character, managed to subdue representatives of the noble class. His inability to handle a sword was more than compensated by the talent of the organizer. Hideyoshi was able to attract, hire, retain, reward and promote people in a brilliant way up the ladder, which can be called a feudal version of a modern Asian corporation. Today, his approach to leadership remains as fresh as it was four centuries ago. The red thread in Hideyoshi's instructions is the idea that the leader himself should be a servant to people, and not turn them into his servants. Nowadays, this ethical principle is rarely used. According to Hideyoshi, 
the key feeling that motivates true leaders to devote themselves to serving others is a sense of gratitude. Perhaps you, like me, will find out what a strong resonance this approach to leadership causes in modern society. And what striking parallels are seen between the deeds of the Monkey King and the most acute political problems of the 21st century. Hideo Shir differs from many of today's leaders as much as from his samurai contemporaries 400 years ago. But if Hideo Shir was an atypical samurai, then what were the samurai as a whole, as a social class? A Brief History of the Samurai The history of samurai began in the 7th century AD, when the Yamato clan came to power in Japan, whose leaders became the ancestors of the imperial dynasty. The word samurai originally meant one who serves and referred to people of noble origin who guarded members of the imperial court. This moral principle of service formed the basis for the formation of the social and spiritual roots of the noble samurai class. Over time, it became difficult for representatives of the Yamato clan to provide centralized governance of the country, and they began to transfer military, administrative and tax functions to former rivals who turned into regional governors. As the Yamato clan and the imperial court weakened, the local rulers gained strength. Over time, some of them received the status of daimyo, feudal princes who ruled their fiefdoms independently of the central government. In the 1185th year, Prince Minamoto no Yoritoma, governor of the eastern provinces and a distant scion of the imperial family, established a military dictatorship in the country. This date marked the entry of Japan into the period of feudalism from 1185th to 1867th year. The type of government founded by Yuri Toma was called the shogunate and existed in Japan for almost 700 years. The political stability achieved by Minamoto in 1185 did not last long. Power alternately passed into the hands of the opposing clans, until in 1467th year the regime of centralized military rule collapsed. Japan was plunged into the abyss of anarchy. Thus began the infamous era of the fighting provinces, the bloody century of the struggle of the upunage princes who defended their possessions and tried to gain the upper hand over their rivals, using assassination attempts, political alliances, dynastic marriages, mutual adoptions and adoptions, as well as open hostilities. In the ruthless struggle for the consolidation of power, daimyo often killed their own children and even parents. By the time Japan plunged into the troubled era of internecine strife, samurai began to be called armed government officials, police squad commanders and professional soldiers. In short, almost everyone who carried a sword and was ready to use it. Despite all the chaos of the period of military anarchy, a strict hierarchy of power remained in feudal Japan. The formal ruler was the emperor, a descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu, before whom every citizen of the country was obliged to kneel. However, the emperor's power functions were almost symbolic. In fact, they were limited to the distribution of official titles. The emperor was completely dependent on the sovereign princes who financed the maintenance of the court, and did not play a role in the practical management of the country's affairs. Following the emperor on the social ladder was the court aristocracy, consisting of princes, princesses and other grandees of the imperial blood. The aristocrats were excluded from the practical administration of the country and maintained their homes at the expense of inherited fortunes and cash receipts from the up-punished princes. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so as not to miss the new items. The shogun was formally subordinate to the aristocracy, but in fact this man possessed all the fullness of real power, and not only the aristocrats, but also the emperor himself were powerless before him. This supreme military ruler served as president or prime minister, making day-to-day -day decisions on the governance of the country. The chaos that reigned in the era of the fighting provinces was also explained by the fact that there was no shogun with unquestionable authority in the country. The main task of this period in the history of Japan was the desire of ambitious provincial princes, such as Odana Banaga, the patron of Hideyoshir, to make their way to Kyoto, receive the title of shogun from the emperor and unite the country. The next rung of the social ladder was occupied by the holders of the title daimyo big name, 
hereditary feudal princes who headed large clans, owned huge fiefdoms and maintained numerous armies. Some of them were capable warriors who created provincial empires literally from scratch, others were former governors who refused to recognize the authority of the central government over themselves and became sovereign rulers of the provinces. There were also many treacherous vassals who usurped the power of their two trusting overlords. Daimyo built castles on their lands, ruled the growing cities and were fed by taxes from citizens and peasants. Further in the social hierarchy were samurai who were in the service of the daimyo. The best of these medieval Japanese knights were selflessly devoted to their overlords and strictly adhered to the Bushido code of honor. Usually this term is translated as the ideals of chivalry or the way of the warrior. The worst were not much different from highwaymen. Even lower is the social status of the ronin, free samurai who did not have a master. Ronins were either people from impoverished families, or those who lost their jobs when their master went bankrupt or was defeated in battle. There were many honest warriors and bandits among the ronin. Representatives of this social group are the last ones who were allowed to bear a surname. Commoners did not have such a privilege. At the base of the social pyramid were the townspeople, artisans, merchants and peasants the working people who made up the vast majority of the country's population. These people had no titles and bore only the name received at birth. In addition, they were the only Japanese citizens required to pay taxes. In this motley picture of estates, samurai turned out to be the brightest, central figures of Japanese history, romantic archetypes comparable to European medieval knights or cowboys of the Wild West. But after Hideyoshi's death, the role of the samurai changed dramatically. With the advent of peace in the country, the need for professional military has sharply decreased. Samurai began to engage less in combat training and began to pay more attention to spiritual development, enlightenment and fine arts. By 1857th year, when the wearing of swords in public places was prohibited by law, and the warrior class was abolished, they became what Hyde Yoshi was almost three centuries ago, samurai without swords. Nevertheless, their legacy helped transform Japan into the most powerful industrial country in the world after the United States. Japanese corporations owe much of their success to the traditional military virtues of discipline, loyalty, and fair play. And the structure of modern Japanese society corresponds to the image of an egalitarian leader created by Hideyoshi. Note to the text Although Hideyoshi left behind thousands of letters and other documents, scientists continue to argue about even such elementary facts of his life as the year of birth. And this is not surprising, considering that he was born a quarter of a century earlier than William Shakespeare. Historians still question the authenticity of some of his exploits and try to establish the background of the many political alliances he concluded. Nevertheless, the general contours of Hideyoshi's life and the key to achievements are recognized as facts. Listeners should understand that there are no historical documents in which Hideyoshi formulates maximum leadership. They are extrapolated by the author from Taikoka, from real events, from everything we know about Hideyoshi's personality, judging by his letters and other documents. I used all the power of my imagination to give Hideyoshi's voice a touch of thoughtfulness and remorse in the right places, despite the obvious evidence that in the last years of his life he demonstrated excessive vanity and arrogance. Some historians believe that in his old age he had serious mental problems. In order to learn leadership lessons from his life, I had to imagine that the Monkey King decided to indulge in reflection at the end of his days and wished to pass on to posterity his wise instructions based on an honest assessment of his own colossal successes and catastrophic failures. I ask you to forgive me this liberty. A note to the translation Samurai Without a Sword is a translation of the book by writer Kidami Masao Management Courses Toyotami Hideyoshi. People who speak Japanese will notice that some changes have been made to the original text. I did it for three reasons. 
Firstly, the management issues described in Kitami's book, which Hideo Shir solved, are closely related to the social traditions and business methods typical of Japan, but unfamiliar to most listeners. For this reason, in this edition I have shortened something and focused on the topic of leadership, which representatives of different cultures understand equally. Secondly, all Japanese people know who Hideo Shir was. Many have heard about his adventures since childhood. While most of the listeners of A Samurai Without a Sword hardly know anything about our main character or his exploits in the era of the fighting provinces. To fill in such gaps that Kidami could safely omit, I had to use a number of historical documents, biographies, and scientific research. Third, I call Hideyoshi a samurai without a sword. It may be objected to me that if we take into account the horrific consequences of some of our hero's actions, he does not deserve such a nickname. But I believe that this phrase accurately expresses his inability to master martial arts and the desire to defeat opponents by peaceful means. Listeners should know that I came up with the name Samurai without a sword specifically for Hideyoshi's figure. It cannot serve as a characteristic of the entire class of peace-loving samurai, is not used in the text by whales and has no analogue in Japanese. Speaking of language I wanted to make the English version fascinating and inspiring for a wide range of readers, but for this I, as an author and translator, had to make compromises. I present Japanese names in the proper order, first the last name, then the first name. But for the sake of simplicity, I use part of the full name of the characters, which will be easier for readers to remember, whether it's a surname or a first name. As a result, Hakazuka Korku becomes my Korku, and Shibata Katsui turns out to be Shibata. I believe that it is already difficult for many to keep in mind and distinguish such unusual and similar names as Mitsunari and Mitsuhida, Masanori and Masamuni, and the like. Therefore, in order not to overload the text, I left the minor characters nameless and minimized the use of archaic geographical names of the 16th century, many of which are unknown even to native Japanese speakers. Another problem is related to the name of our main character. Thanks to numerous promotions, Hideyoshi's name has changed so often that even Japanese listeners find it difficult to remember which names he wore at different stages of his career. I simplified the matter by using only one name in the book, which he received at birth, Hideyoshi. I struggled with these and other difficulties for a long time, but in the end I decided that strict compliance with scientific facts would make this book unbearably boring for all but the most passionate lovers of Japanese history. I hope you will be satisfied with the result. And finally, I would like to express my gratitude to Kidami Masao for allowing this book to be adapted for English-speaking listeners, to my agent Marty Jewett for valuable advice and tireless support of this project, as well as to James Reed Harrison for his help in editing. Tim Clark, Tokyo, Japan and Portland, Oregon, August 2000. Chapter 1. Gratitude, Hard Work, Determination in Actions and Dedication. So, boy, do you want to serve me? A horseman in a horned helmet, black against the dark blue sky, towered over me like a demon. And I was kneeling in front of him in the mud of the road. I couldn't make out his face, but there was only authority in the rumble of his voice, and there was not even a hint of mockery in his question. I tried to say something, but only a faint hiss escaped from my throat. My bloodline dried up so much, as if I was dying of thirst. But I had to answer. My fate depended on the answer, and, although I didn't know it then, the fate of the whole of Japan. Raising my head so that I could take in the whole demonic figure, I saw that he was looking at me like a hawk ready to grab a field mouse with its claws. When I managed to speak, my voice was clear and even, with every syllable it added confidence. That's right, Prince Nabunaga, I confirmed. I want to. This happened in the midst of the time of troubles of civil strife, the age of wars, when the earth was flooded with blood and the only law was the law of the sword. I was a teenager, wandering alone from village to village in search of happiness, without a single medic in my pocket. But even then I wanted to be a leader and lead people, although I had no idea how far this desire would take me. 
My name is Toya Tami Hideyoshi. Today I am the supreme ruler of all Japan, the first peasant who has ever managed to reach the top of power. Note. In the last years of his life, Hideyoshi held the position of Taika, or retired imperial regent. Despite his retirement, the status of a take was higher than that of a kampak or imperial regent. Nominally, both Taika and Kampaku obeyed the emperor. However, the power of the emperor was symbolic. In fact, Hideyoshi was the supreme ruler of Japan. I am the only prince out of more than 200 daimers who divided the whole country among themselves, who achieved his position through hard work, and did not receive it by birthright. I rose from poverty to rule a powerful country and command hundreds of thousands of samurai. Now I am writing these words and I hope that my story will awaken in people the desire to develop leadership qualities. Some of you are already leading followers. Some have just embarked on the path of leadership. Others follow someone, but dream of going forward themselves. Regardless of your position in life, enduring secrets will serve you well, because they are equally useful for those who obey and for those to whom they obey. People awarded me the nickname Monkey for my mischievous disposition, as well as for my protruding ears, huge head and puny body. I am small and ugly. Those who see me for the first time are shocked by my appearance. They don't expect that the most powerful person in the country can turn out to be a bald, ugly dwarf. Some people call me the ugliest leader in the history of Japan. Well, let it be. Despite the fame of the most unsightly supreme ruler, there were many people in my life who served me faithfully. Because I have served them faithfully. This is the secret of devotion, which I will tell you about later. You may be surprised by the fact that my successful path to the heights of leadership was built on the basic concepts of dedication, gratitude, hard work and determination in actions. These principles look so trivial that at first glance they are not considered secrets. But few people realize their true power. Even fewer people realize that they form the basis of the samurai code, a set of rules of conduct revered for hundreds of years. The samurai code covers not only the sphere of handling weapons, to which I am very grateful, because I have earned the reputation of the worst fighter in the history of Japan. But I have another weapon of truly monstrous power in my arsenal, my mind, and therefore you can call me a samurai without a sword. Throughout my ascent to the heights of leadership, I strictly followed these rules. They were my best assistants. The leadership lessons I received back then have not lost their significance to this day. And the samurai code meets the needs of leaders in Japan and beyond. I was born into a poor peasant family in the village of Nakamura, in the province of Accident. Note. Nakamura today. This is a district of the city of Nagoya, one of the largest megacities in Japan, where the headquarters of the Toyota Corporation is located. The rootless, ugly, monkey-like poor man is me, Hideyoshi, the monkey boy. My father died young. My stepfather and I were constantly fighting. I did not receive an education, was not trained in a craft and did not enjoy any privileges of the noble estate. But I tried to make the most of the few advantages that I was endowed with. My advantage was poverty, because it helped me to understand the meaning of the struggle for existence that a person from the bottom has to lead. 95% of those who participate in the battle are infantrymen, people standing on the lower rungs of society. I understand well what such people feel and think, because I myself was once one of them. That is why I have learned to win their loyalty and admiration so skillfully, and they are happy to do anything for me. No noble gentleman can compare with me in this. How can those who have always had food and clothes understand those who have never had these things? My biggest drawbacks, at least that's what I thought at first, were my small stature and puny build. In my youth, I wanted to become a samurai more than anything in the world, but I lacked the strength and dexterity to do this. In the age of the warrior, each prince had to keep his own army to protect his power. Therefore, soldiers were often recruited from peasants. It was difficult for those of us who did not have good physical characteristics to distinguish ourselves. 
I've never been skilled with a sword. Any rundown ronin would have easily cracked my skull in a street brawl. Note. Ronin is a samurai who has no master. Sometimes the ronin served as mercenaries. Therefore, I quickly realized that it was necessary to develop the mind, not the body, especially if I was going to keep my head on my shoulders. So I became a samurai who relies on his brains more than on weapons. I preferred strategy to the sword, and logic to the spear. My approach to leadership allowed me to get the better of my rivals. Thousands of samurai followed me into fire and water without hesitation, both plebeians and aristocrats willingly gave their lives for me. I am eternally grateful to all of them for their sacrifices. And gratitude, as you will see, is at the heart of successful leadership. Leaders should be grateful. My story has a humble beginning. Besides being poor, uneducated, and of low birth, I was short, weak, and ugly. But I didn't let those flaws determine my fate. I was driven by such a passionate desire to live, which is rarely found in this world. Despite the fact that I happened to be born into a family of an equity investor, I aspired to become a leader and was determined not to let my imperfections become an obstacle. Deep down, I always knew that my potential was greater than everyone else thought. My father was a peasant at first, then became an infantryman in the army of the Oda clan, and soon he was crippled in battle. To make ends meet, the mother was forced to work as a day laborer. After my father's death, when I was seven years old, she married a man named Chikwami, also a peasant and a former soldier of Oda. I loved my mother with all my heart, whose life was a chain of ordeals. Even as a little boy, I felt the weight of her torment, and my fate was determined by the desire to ease her burden, but only after I caused her even more pain. The thing is, I was a big mischief maker. I hated school, loved throwing rocks and playing war. It was difficult for my mother to control me, so she entrusted the care of my upbringing and education to the monks of a Buddhist temple, in the hope that they would be able to teach me discipline there. But I ignored the teacher's instructions and spent whole days wandering the streets, hunting stray cats with a bamboo spear and fighting butterflies with a wooden sword. Soon the monks gave up on me. They said that the Buddha himself would not have enough patience to follow Hideyoshir, and sent me home. When I returned to my family, I mowed grass and fished to help my mother make ends meet. But still we often had to starve. However, the worst thing was that I didn't get along with my stepfather, who made it a habit to punish me with rods. One day my mother decided that she couldn't stand it anymore. Hideyoshi, she said. Since you don't want to study, and the monks no longer agree to study with you, I have agreed to give you as an apprentice to the neighbors so that you can master at least some craft. I couldn't believe my ears. I have always considered my mother to be my only ally. How can you do this to me? I asked. When she heard that, she started crying and hugged me so hard that I almost suffocated. I'm afraid that if you continue to contradict your stepfather, it will not end well. One day he won't be able to stop and will beat you to death. I can't take it anymore. Please, for God's sake, leave this house. I will miss you with all my heart, but you have to go. No, I don't want to leave. I cried. I love you, mom. Listen to me carefully, Hideyoshi, she said through tears. To live in this world, you need to have land and money. I didn't want to get married again, but we had to survive. Now you have to take care of yourself. This was not the last time I had to leave my home in order to enroll in education at my mother's insistence. Similar scenes were repeated over and over again, each time with the same result. My mother begged me to find a good place for myself. I would go to study a new craft with another family, where after a few months I would be turned out of the door, after which I would return home again. My mother hurled reproaches at me. In despair, she wrung her hands and shed bitter tears. But I ignored her admonition and dreamed only of becoming a samurai's servant. One day I made a decision. Mom, I'm leaving forever to find my own way, I said. I'm not coming back until I achieve fame. 
Although I was only fifteen years old, the determination in my eyes convinced her of the futility of any objections. Seeing me off with tears in her eyes, she handed me a heavy bag of copper coins, which was enough to buy rice for a year. My mother knew the dangers of a teenager wandering around the country alone, and she was afraid that we would never see each other again. Therefore, she gave me all the money that was intended for me as an inheritance. It was more than the working peasants left to their children. She denied herself everything to save every coin. Suddenly I realized how much she loved me and how much she had to sacrifice. For the first time in my life, I was overcome by a feeling of sincere gratitude. On the day when I set off along a country road that took me away from my native village, outside of which I had never been before. I made a firm decision to do everything to make my mother's life easier. I will work my way up, save her from backbreaking labor in the field and provide such amenities as she could only dream of. Gratitude ignited in me an uncontrollable desire to grow myself and help others. Contrary to popular belief, the essence of leadership is to serve other people, not to use their services. Those who seek to arouse the desire of others to follow themselves, it is necessary to learn the secret of gratitude. Leaders should be grateful. Leaders should work harder than others. Leaving home marked the beginning of a new life in search of work. In Kyosu, the first stop on my way, I spent most of my inheritance on the purchase of needles for sewing cotton fabrics. Needles were expensive, but they were easier to carry than a bag of coins, and they were always in demand. At that time, Japan needed a lot of cotton fabrics. They went not only for clothes, but also for military needs. I planned to sell the needles to village seamstresses and samurai families. The life of a traveling retailer is hard, especially for a 15-year-old teenager. Soon I used up my last savings and began to take on any job a cleaner, a driver, anything I could find, just to fill my stomach with food. I slept in the open air and didn't eat anything for days. Sometimes I even begged. Sometimes I managed to find a job, even for a mere pittance and for a short time. I tried dozens of occupations, worked as a carpenter, cooper, fisherman, metal smelter, mower and charcoal burner's assistant, oil seller, knife grinder, you can't remember everything. I have mastered the art of market trading perfectly, learned to guess the desire of buyers and employers, to catch the mood of the crowd. I had to witness generosity in greed, gratitude and meanness, generosity in treachery. Observing the behavior of people in different spheres of life, including commercial and social, I honed the ability to understand characters. Gradually, my ability to penetrate into the hiding place of the human soul grew, I learned to identify the needs of representatives of all classes and gain their trust. But the dream of becoming a samurai still attracted me more than the prospect of achieving mastery in the plebeian professions. I went to Sampa, the seat of the Imagawa clan, a powerful samurai family that ruled three provinces on the Pacific coast. Note. Sampa corresponds to today's Shizuoka province. To get there, I had to drag myself for several weeks along the endless road of the Eastern Sea, the main transport route connecting Western and Eastern Japan. As I walked along it, I kept replaying in my head how I would ask the prince and Mageva to take me into service. One day, when I was resting on the bridge, a Matsushita vassal rode past me. His name was Naganori. He held the position of castle manager. Note. Traditionally, it is considered that the first samurai served by Hyde Yoshi was Matsushita Yukitsuna. But, according to the writer Kiyami, strong evidence today suggests that the first owner of Hideyoshir was Matsushito Gadsman on Ganner. Later he told me that when he first saw me, he did not understand who I was, a man who looked like a monkey, or a monkey who looked like a man. Where are you from, man? He asked on Ganner, looking down at me from a height. And from the village of Nakamura, in the province of Accident, I replied. I'm heading east to look for a job at the samurai estate. He burst out laughing at the Ganner. Who would hire such a skinny little guy? 
and you don't look much like a gentleman yourself. Just because you didn't like my appearance doesn't mean that others won't like it. Hearing this unexpectedly mocking rebuke, he burst out laughing again, and then continued to question me. I managed to attract the attention of a member of an influential samurai family. On Ganor, he took me to Matsushita Castle and introduced me to other vassals as a funny kid. I caused them to laugh together, greedily devouring chestnuts and persimmons that were thrown to me. They started calling me a monkey, too. Soon I was already known by all the inhabitants of the castle, and the cooks were fed to the brim twice a day. That's how my life in the Matsushita clan began. Matsushita are vassals of the Imagawa clan, which was headed by Yoshimoto, a famous general and patron of the arts. At first, I was assigned to the position of a sandal wearer who follows his master everywhere during the day, putting on and taking off shoes, and at the same time performs countless small tasks. Then I was promoted to valet. In this position, I watched the wardrobes of the gentlemen and helped them dress and undress. In the end, I was assigned to manage the storerooms. Because I did my job excellently, I was considered a valuable servant. Prince Matsushito honored me with my first name. Nakamura, after the name of my hometown. Note. At that time, peasants and townspeople of the lower class often did not have surnames and wore only first names. The presence of a surname was a sign of a privileged position. Therefore, a change of position or social status was often accompanied by a change of surname. Thus, Hideyoshi was given the name Hayoshi at birth. Some researchers believe that his real name was Hezamaru, but at various stages of his career he was known as Takatira, Nakamura Takatira, Kenoshita Takatira, Hashiba Taiken Zen no, Kami Hideyoshir and Tu and Tami Hideyoshir. The frequent change of names confuses even Japanese readers, so in the book I used the name Hideyoshir. I was extremely proud of my role as a storeroom keeper. I got a guard dog and made every effort to ensure the safety of the property. With my appointment to this position, the thefts that happened earlier completely stopped. I liked this job, as well as all other positions. And not only because I finally got out of humiliating poverty. I considered every new assignment, no matter how trivial, another step up the career ladder. Since I had no physical advantages, I decided that the only way to distinguish myself for me was exceptional zeal in work. However, no one likes outsiders who make a fast-paced career. One day an envious servant falsely accused me of stealing some small change from the storerooms. Others have added new charges to this. And in the end, Naganor told me that I had aroused the hatred of all Matsushita's servants. He was very sorry, but he couldn't fire all the haters to keep me in the service. That's why he had to break up with me. When I started protesting and swearing my innocence, I got angry and called me an impudent person. I burst into tears and immediately left Matsushita Castle. By that time I was 18 years old. The dismissal was a severe shock for me, but the despondency quickly disappeared. I was sure that someone would definitely appreciate my merits. I was beginning to understand that it was useless to take offense at the twists of fate. The only thing that can benefit is the lessons learned from the experience gained. Many years later, Having already achieved success, I found time to think about how to adequately thank those to whom I felt deeply indebted, who helped me in my youth. I decided to find a Matsushita clan vassal on Ghana, who hired me, and then had to fire me. I wanted to express my deep gratitude to him for his support at the beginning of my career. Unable to find him myself, I rewarded his son, Yukitsuna, with a large plot of land and made him a prince. I did everything I could to repay the kindness. Exceptional performance allows those who have nothing to surpass those who have privileges and position. This is the secret of diligence. Leaders should work harder than others. At critical moments, act boldly. Having lost my job in the Matsushita clan, I promised myself that the choice of the next owner would be the result of my conscious decision, and not a chance meeting like the one that happened on the bridge earlier. But to whom should I enter the service? My native province of accident was ruled by the young Prince Oda Nobunaga. 
At one time, my father served in the army of his father, Nabuhida. For his fearlessness in battle, the vassals nicknamed Prince Nabunaga the Lightning of War. Taking into account his reputation, as well as my own observations, I decided that Prince Nabunaga would be not only a suitable employer for me, but also a worthy mentor. When I chose him for the role of the new master, there was a problem, how to get his attention. I was full of enthusiasm, but I didn't have any virtues, including the title, bloodline, and reputation of a warrior. The only area of activity where I felt confident was commerce. With the experience of a traveling merchant behind me, I was well versed in the true market value of goods and services. In addition, I have long noticed that samurai who believed that such things were unworthy of their attention often turned out to be helpless victims of cunning merchants who easily tricked them around their finger. Thanks to my poverty, I knew how to save every penny. If only there was a way to impress Mr. Nabunaga. With my request to give me a place in his organization, I decided to turn to the prince, because I expected that such a person should appreciate courage in people and put business qualities above pedigree. I was right. Deciding to grease the wheels of my plan, I met a servant from the Oda castle and paid a hundred copper coins, all the money I had, so that he would tell me exactly where and when Prince Nabuniga would go. This investment turned out to be the most successful in my life. On a spring evening 1554th year on the border of the province of accident and mine, I hid behind bushes near the massive gate of the house of a noble family, where Prince Nabuniga often stayed. This was my third attempt to ambush the arrival of the young prince and his retinue. For the first time, he flashed. There was a way to impress Mr. Nabuniga. With my request to give me a place in his organization, I decided to turn to the prince, because I expected that such a person should appreciate courage in people and put business qualities above pedigree. I was right. Deciding to lubricate the wheels of my plan, I met a servant from the castle of Oda and paid a hundred copper coins, all the money I had, so that he would tell me exactly where and when the prince would go on paper. This investment turned out to be the most successful in my life. On a spring evening in 1554, on the border of the province of accident and mine, I hid behind bushes near the massive gate of the house of a noble family, where Prince Nabuniga often stayed. This was my third attempt to ambush the arrival of the young prince and his retinue. The first time, he rushed past before I could jump out on the side of the road. The second time I called his name, but a sudden downpour drowned out my greeting and soaked me to the skin. Luck was on my side that night. When Prince Nabuniga stopped his steed at the gate, I jumped out onto the dirt road, bent so low that my eyebrows touched the ground, and exclaimed, Mr. Nabuniga, I offer you my services. The head of the Oda clan gave me a stern look. So, boy, do you want to serve me? He said through his teeth. That's exactly what I want, Mr. Nabuniga, I confirmed. This little monkey thinks he can be useful, he mused. It was more of a reflection than a question, but I answered anyway. I raised my head and looked him straight in the eye. Yes, sir. I think I can, I said in a respectful but confident enough tone. The general raised his head arrogantly. Well, then remind me, he said. Addressing the light, how much does it cost me to keep one of you? Nabunaga did not wait for someone to dare to give an answer. One person eats 150 kilograms of rice a year. Add to this misa, salt, vegetables, beans, fish and game once every ten days, as well as the cost of maintaining the kitchen and food delivery. That is, in terms of rice, another 125 kilograms for everyone I hire. Note. Misa is a paste made from fermented soybeans. Rice and misa soup form the basis of the Japanese diet. Even today, many Japanese eat misa soup and rice two or even three times a day. Add here the cost of two sets of clothes per year, pocket change for women and alcohol. 
And it turns out that even such a runt as this monkey crawling in the mud at my feet gets 425 kilograms of rice from me a year. His words caused many infantrymen to lower their eyes. This well-known lecture meant that their leader was out of sorts. What do you say to that, monkey? The prince threw a sarcastic glance at the paper. Will your services be able to justify all these expenses? Yes, sir, I answered without hesitation. My service will double, no, triple these costs. How is this possible? The general roared, clutching the reins. My answer sounded confident, at the expense of economy, my lord. I will work for three. This day was the date of the official start of my service with Prince Nabuniga. At first I was a simple servant, but I didn't stay in this capacity for long. One brave act changed my fate and may change yours. Don't be like a person who, after twenty years, begins to remember the past and belatedly regret that he didn't take advantage of the only opportunity that could change his life. Grab it with both hands. Luck accompanies the fearless. Leaders should fearlessly use the secret of determination. At critical moments, act boldly. Dedicate yourself to the leader. Joining the Oda clan turned out to be a turning point in my development as a leader. Prince Nabuniga gave me the opportunity to succeed because he highly appreciated my usefulness in matters unrelated to the war. I became his lifesaver, a person capable of completing any task. In the first days of my service with the prince on paper, I rarely managed to sleep peacefully at night. A servant must always be ready to fulfill any order of his master. I had to anticipate when, day and night, he might suddenly come up with the desire to go falconry or horseback riding, and prepare everything necessary in advance. Besides, he kept a large stable, and I had to guess which of the horses he would deign to saddle today and which one tomorrow. Is it worth mentioning that the prince himself looked like a wild stallion with his temper? My position was troublesome, but it justified the efforts expended a hundredfold. In addition to serving the prince on paper, I could observe the large Oda family and influential representatives of other clans. I was honored to be involved in the political moves and intrigues that are widespread in the age of wars. But most importantly, with the help of tireless work, I managed to show myself worthy of the leader's trust. I've always tried to work three times as hard as the others. Just like many others, Prince Nabuniga liked to call me a monkey and when I turned forty, then a bald rat. Appearance has always confused me. But leaders must be able to turn their shortcomings into an advantage. Once, during the prince's falconry on paper, a bird of prey fell off the falconer's hand and got entangled in its own leash at the top of a tall tree. Monkey ordered Nabuniga. Free the bird. I have never refused to follow the orders of my superiors and I am proud that I have always done it with readiness and joy. Yes, my lord, I barked. Then, imitating a chimpanzee, he walked awkwardly to the tree and began to climb up the trunk. I am a little monkey who quickly completes any task. My antics caused the prince on paper and everyone around him to laugh amicably, a sense of humor and a willingness to provide services irreplaceable qualities for anyone who aspires to become a leader. One frosty winter day, I was waiting for the prince on paper, standing at the staff tent with his sandals in my hands. Despite the fact that I was terribly cold, I kept the sandals on my chest to keep them warm. When Mr. Nabuniga came out of the tent and saw how much I cared about his comfort, he was deeply touched. Shortly after that, I received a significant promotion. Loyalty to others breeds their loyalty to you. Only someone who is devoted to someone himself can claim the title of leader. If you want people to follow you, learn the secret of devotion. Dedicate yourself to the leader. Bosses, subordinates and samurai cynics consider gratitude, hard work, determination and dedication to be elementary concepts that do not deserve attention. But watch the world. You will see that ungrateful people tend to be unhappy. 
you will see that hard work is the most important condition for success, and luck accompanies the brave. You will see that loyalty to parents, children, bosses and subordinates pays off handsomely. Some might think that only followers should follow these simple principles, but not leaders. But those who seek to lead others must learn to serve. And those who intend to command others must learn to control themselves. Therefore, compliance with the principles of leadership is useful for both superiors and subordinates. Gratitude, dedication, hard work and determination in actions. These words easily slip off the tongue, but these principles harden the soul of a samurai and form the basis of leadership. Follow them and you will transform your life as I did. Chapter 2 How to Choose a Leader and Distinguish Yourself Choosing a leader that makes sense to follow is the most important decision in a young person's career. And now I will tell you what criteria I used when I chose Prince Nabunaga as my master, and what methods allowed me to distinguish myself in the service. Learn my secrets and you can do the same. Choose a visionary leader. If you are starting your career from scratch, like me, then the key to your advancement may be choosing exactly the leader you should serve. I was lucky that I chose an organization headed by a promising young leader, Oda Nabunaga, who became my teacher and patron. The dignity of the prince on paper exceeded my expectations. His rapid rise in this world allowed me to rise with him. Some people go so far as to attribute my success entirely to a happy accident that linked my fate with Prince Nabunaga. But they confuse luck with purposefulness. They see luck in everything, but they do not notice my perseverance and enthusiasm, as well as a sober calculation in choosing a leader. Luck affects all spheres of life, but the main importance is the definition of goals and the mobilization of the forces of the body and soul to achieve them. Am I grateful to fate for the opportunity to get into the service of Prince Nabunaga? Of course. But this possibility cannot be explained by luck alone. I carefully considered who had the best chance of uniting the country, and carefully considered many candidates before I considered the prince on paper the most likely candidate for the role of the future Saigon. Here are the four criteria I used. You would be wise to make them the basis for choosing your next employer. How far-sighted is the leader? How progressive is he thinking? What does the leader attach more importance to, efficiency or generosity? Does the size of his organization correspond to your goals? The prince's activity on paper was subordinated to the desire to unite Japan under the rule of a single ruler and put an end to the century of wars. This is exactly what the country and the people need. Uncertainty about the future can be felt by residents of any country in the world, but no one felt it more keenly than Japanese peasants in an age of terrible bloodshed. They had more than enough reasons for this. These were truly dark days. A leader is a person with a clear vision of better times, able to paint a picture of the future and instill confidence in others. Prince Nabunaga was just such a person. Another attractive quality of my new master was his youth. At the time of entering his service, I was 18, and the prince had just turned 21 on paper, so I was sure that he was destined for a long future. The combination of youth and foresight is a sure guarantee of success. By the time I joined the Oda clan, the audacious and eccentric behavior on paper made many people, including members of his own organization, doubt the mental balance of this man. Among themselves, detractors called him a fool. But I knew that the prince could be accused of anything but stupidity. He despised the traditional rules of behavior and was far ahead of his time. Nabunaga became the first commander in Japan to form a regular army. Until then, military leaders kept permanent recruitment centers in rural communities, which, if necessary, recruited peasants in the militia. A century of wars, 80% of all soldiers were peasants, who played such an important role in the life of the country that military leaders followed the unwritten rule of avoiding battles during the sowing and harvesting season. Prince Nabunaga ignored this tradition and radically changed the ratio of the number of peasants and professional soldiers. Eighty-odd percent of the soldiers in his army were professional soldiers. 
The maintenance of an army that does not depend on the needs of agriculture has become a key factor in its military superiority. He fought the traditional way of life as hard as he fought his enemies. Prince Nabuniga became the author of many innovations. Unlike his contemporaries, he recruited servants from representatives of different estates and geographical regions. In matters of hiring people, he gave preference to abilities rather than pedigree, and rewarded them according to merit rather than rank. Rumors about Prince Nabuniga's new approach to hiring services attracted many gifted people from all over the country. In addition, he chose an unorthodox approach to warfare, quickly assessing the advantage of new technologies and mastering the tactics of mass use of firearms. In the Battle of Nagashina, the prince fielded 3,000 riflemen armed with rifles. At that time, the use of multiple rocket launchers on such a scale was an unprecedented case, even for Europe. Note. Soldiers were usually armed with arquebuses. The arquebus is a matchlock gun, one of the first types of firearms, the predecessor of the musket. It was fired from a tripod or from a fork stand. My lack of education and low birth did not allow me to get a job in large organizations headed by high-ranking princes. But I was optimistic about the situation, reasoning that in a smaller clan, it would be easier for a new employee to establish direct contact with the management. I figured that if I could prove myself well, then I would have more opportunities for promotion in a fast-growing organization. The better I got to know the prince on paper, the stronger my confidence became that he was the promising leader who was worth serving. Do you want to continue your climb up the career ladder? Then use the secret of foresight. Choose a visionary leader. Throw all your strength into completing the current task. I started my career with the prince on Banaga as a sandal bearer, just like with the first samurai I served on Ganner. But Prince Nabuniga was an unusual leader. In matters of military operations, the management of conquered territories, conducting diplomatic negotiations or the leadership of lower personnel, he believed in the competence of his subordinates and allowed them to perform their duties in the best way, from their point of view. Having made a decision, he gave a short order in an authoritative voice, jumped into the saddle and galloped away, leaving the crowd of executive servants to decide for themselves how to meet the allotted deadlines. With such a lightning-fast leadership style, maintaining a set pace was extremely difficult even at the best of times. Round-the-clock activity was a habitual way of life in the Oda castle, so I chose a dwelling near the main gate. My bed was a straw mat spread on the dirt floor. But rest in such conditions made it possible to monitor all the movements of the prince on Banaga and instantly fulfill all his desires, even if it made the possibility of a full night's rest an impossible dream. The other servants looked down on my work, but I was proud of my position and put my whole soul into fulfilling the assigned duties. My line of conduct was simple, always throwing all my strength into completing the current task. Any assignment, even the most insignificant, given to those who are above you, requires complete dedication. A significant part of my duties consisted in fulfilling the personal wishes of Prince Nabunich, and I did my best to draw his attention to my diligence. For example, early one morning a fire started in the castle. I woke up before the alarm sounded, and immediately ran to the stable, where I heard the frightened neighing of horses and saw the silhouettes of people rushing in panic against the background of flames. Prince Nabunigat dressed quickly and went down to the courtyard. At the moment when his figure emerged from the cloud of smoke, I appeared in front of him with a saddled horse. Sitting astride, it was more convenient for him to direct rescue operations. Another time, Prince Nabuniga with a handful of soldiers left in the pre-dawn fog to suddenly attack the enemy's outpost. As his stallion trotted past the castle gates, he noticed the lonely figure of a man sitting on a horse and impatiently waiting for his master outside the fortress walls. Who is that there? He shouted. It's me, a hideosi. It sounded in response. I was able to recognize the signs of an upcoming sortie and decided that I should accompany my master. Prince Nabuniga was surprised by such a display of bravery of a man who was not obliged to participate in hostilities. 
but I was determined to go beyond the prescribed functions. Exceeding expectations is the motto of my whole life. Prince Nibunaga loved falconry and could go on it at any time of the day. When he had this desire, he would go to the courtyard, put a bird of prey on his arm and shout, Is there anyone here? In such cases, the prince invariably heard my answer. I am here, my lord. Soon my master got used to the fact that the monkey always appears nearby, it is only necessary to call him. I never missed an opportunity to fulfill the prince's wishes, even if it consisted of bringing water, clearing a path overgrown with weeds, or finding a sparrow that had been shot. One evening, during some military campaign, Prince Nabunaga and his soldiers were resting in a camping camp. Everything was covered with a terrible fog, so thick that even an outstretched hand could not be seen. Knowing that the soldiers on guard at night can relax, Prince Nabunaga decided to test their vigilance. And at that moment, he suddenly heard someone walking around the posts and shouting, The guards do not sleep. The guards do not sleep. These strange coincidences continued every night, exactly at the hour of the horse. Note. Traditionally in Japan, the day was divided into twelve hours. The hour of the horse lasted from 23.00 to 1 o'clock in the morning. Intrigued, Prince Nabunaga decided to find out who this mysterious sentinel was. Naturally, it was me. My vigilance made such an impression on the prince that he promoted me. Successful leaders understand the secret of total dedication. Throw all your strength into completing the current task. Use your natural abilities. People are often surprised, although only a few dare to ask, why, despite my physical characteristics, did I succeed in military service? In truth, my skill with weapons left much to be desired. So instead of swinging a sword or a spear, I decided that I would be more useful if I wielded the knuckles of shields, an old mechanical calculator that I masterfully owned. I offered the prince on paper to entrust me with the task of supplying firewood. There was hardly a place more remote from the samurai world than the position of a woodcutter. She was inconspicuous, unattractive and unattractive. The other servants looked at her with contempt, they associated her with the cares of the castle kitchen, where the most stupid workers were sent. However, I felt that I would be able to improve the financial situation of the Oda house by reducing expenses. Mr. Nabunaga differed from his contemporaries in that he celebrated and rewarded people for non-military services, and also encouraged the desire of subordinates to develop natural abilities. I was able to stand out from the crowd because Nabunaga recognized the value of servants who could work well not only with their hands, but also with their heads. The opportunity to show what I am capable of presented itself to me after Prince Nabunaga moved to Kiyosu Castle, and the supply of firewood turned into a serious problem. Firewood was needed for cooking and heating, and the price for them grew every year. My first step as a new woodcutter was a thorough study of fuel consumption. I went to the kitchen to determine the amount of firewood burned every day for cooking. Good morning, I cheerfully greeted the kitchen workers, who cast incredulous glances at the alien with the monkey face. I've come to help you a little, I assured them. I immediately began to wash and cook rice for soup, and in the process I measured the amount of wood burned. The kitchen workers clearly knew their job and worked honestly. Well done, I said. Keep up the good work. You don't waste a single log. After that, I started studying the issue of fuel supplies. My predecessor, outraged by the loss of his position, met me with undisguised hostility. He was a tall, sullen man, blind in one eye. Smiling happily and pretending not to notice his displeasure, I greeted him with the most respectful air I was capable of. Hello, dear. My name is Hideyoshi. I was given the task of harvesting firewood, but I don't know anything about this business. Would you be so kind as to introduce me to the intricacies of this work? So you're going to report my blunders to the prince? The man grumbled. Yes, I had no such thoughts, I was sincerely indignant. All I need to know is how you buy and deliver firewood to the castle. Reluctantly, the former woodcutter began to tell me about the details, 
and I realized that everything was out of hand. Firstly, he made purchases randomly and did not have a clear procurement plan. Secondly, the conclusion of contracts with suppliers was entrusted to subordinates. Thirdly, on the way to the castle, the firewood passed through the hands of numerous intermediaries. No wonder the price of firewood is rising by leaps and bounds, I thought. Why not abandon intermediaries and not buy firewood from manufacturers? Heading to the mill and pondering my scheme of direct purchases, I noticed a lot of dead trees cluttering the forest. Suddenly it dawned on me. I turned around and hurried to the village headman's house. How many dry trees do you think there are in your village? I asked the headman. Maybe you'll let me pick them up for free. If you bring them to the castle, I will give a few young saplings for each dry tree. The shrewd old man smiled, calculating in his mind what benefits the stranger could bring to the villagers. He told them about my offer, and the peasants began to willingly bring firewood directly to the residence. Soon Prince Nabuniga summoned me to his chambers. As I understand it, you have come up with a new way of harvesting firewood? He asked. Ladies, sir, I replied. Direct deliveries of firewood to Kiyosu Castle will not cost us anything. However, you will have to pay for the seedlings. From the expression on the prince's face on paper, I could tell what he was thinking. This man is different from my other servants. If you are striving to become a leader, learn the secret of difference. If you want to stand out, use your natural abilities. Subordinate your interests to the interests of the leader. The most notorious scoundrel in the history of the Oda clan was one of its strongest warriors. Mitsuhida. Note. Hideyoshi's point of view is presented here. Some historians do not evaluate Mitsuhida's actions so unambiguously. He and I were brothers in arms once. Now I curse even his name. Mitsuhida, like me, was a vassal of the prince on paper. But that was where our similarity ended. Mitsuhida received an excellent education and was proud of his scholarship. He did not forgive mistakes and rarely showed a sense of humor. An expert in the field of martial arts, Mitsuhida constantly took care of improving his own skills and purposefully sought to achieve this goal. Compared to him, I looked like an uncouth, semi-literate lout. I was equally ready to entertain aristocrats and plebeians with my jokes. As a soldier, I was a laughing stock. However, instead of seeking fame through self-improvement, I devoted myself to serving my leader. For example, as soon as I became a servant of the prince on paper, I immediately began to study my new employer. Each of his actions became an example for me, from which I tried to learn a useful lesson. The exceptional diligence with which I sought to understand the owner allowed me to thoroughly study his character, likes and dislikes. And the more I got to know him, the stronger my devotion to him became. The famous water assault on Takamatsu Castle in 1582 demonstrated the depth of my devotion. During the siege, I came up with the idea to cut off the defenders from the Allied food suppliers and reinforcements, forcing the nearest river to flood the fortress and the surrounding lands. This strategy ensured Takamatsu's downfall. But instead of capturing the castle myself, I sent a message to the prince on Bunaga with a proposal to come to the place, take command of the army and reap the laurels of the winner. I have learned well the surest way to achieve promotion is to make sure that your master looks as good as possible. Meanwhile, Mitsuhide sacrificed the interests of his leader to his own pride. When I was leading the siege of Takamatsu, Prince Nabunaga sent Mitsuhida and thirteen of his generals in order to attack other fortresses. According to tradition, Mitsuhida's name, as the most noble by origin, should have been the first in the document, but for some reason it turned out to be in the middle of the list. Previously, he had already had sharp disagreements with Prince Nabunaga, and now he saw this accident as a personal insult and considered it a drop that overflowed the cup. Violating the order, he went to Kyoto, where he treacherously killed our master, after which he tried to proclaim himself a shogun. This insidious betrayal shocked the country and caused chaos in the house of Oda. But I kept my sanity and swore revenge. I immediately concluded a truce with the enemy, and then a rapid march. 
his troops attacked Mitsuhida and defeated his forces. At the end of the battle, Mitsuhida fled the battlefield and was hacked to death by a group of peasants. Later I will acquaint you with the details of the great march undertaken to avenge the murder of Prince Nabunich, as well as how subsequent events made me the supreme ruler. In the meantime, remember the secret of service. Subordinate your interests to the interests of the leader. Vision and choice. When I was young and naive, I thought that leaders are people who always make the right decisions. Life experience has shown that even great leaders make mistakes. Now I have grasped the truth. Great leaders may make mistakes, but they do not doubt the correctness of the ultimate goal. A clear and true vision of the future, capable of instilling hope and confidence in followers, is a distinctive feature of genuine leaders. Prince Nobunaga's confidence in the need to unite Japan contributed to his transformation from an ordinary feudal lord of the supreme suzerain, and from managing tens to commanding millions. The clarity and power of this vision helped me reach the pinnacle of power. Remember, the people you choose as a patron influence the trajectory of your life more than the cause to which you decide to devote yourself. Young people suffer from the tendency to exaggerate the importance of affairs and to downplay the importance of people. I advise you to pay less attention to what you do and more to who you serve. I chose the leader, the paper was submitted. Who will you choose? Chapter 3. How to do the impossible. I don't believe in the existence of the impossible. I've had to do a lot of seemingly impossible things in my life. Now I can say that the main task of every leader is to make the impossible possible. But how? Approach each task with unyielding determination. I managed to achieve a lot precisely because I was not afraid to make and implement my decisions. I always acted as if my whole life depended on the successful completion of the current task, as sometimes happened. To achieve something, you need confidence. People quickly find reasons that turn difficulties into insurmountable obstacles. They convince themselves that the problem facing them is too difficult, and success is impossible. But why take a pessimistic position from the very beginning? Wouldn't it be better to think about how to achieve the goal instead? Unyielding determination tempers the will, turning it into a serb capable of mowing down any obstacle on the way. Great leaders believe they can do anything. This is their secret of fearlessness. Approach each task with unyielding determination. Be a leader, not a boss. A person who is afraid of you will follow orders, but will never be faithful. If you put yourself above your employees, then know, as soon as fate turns away from you, they will turn away too. The people I led would have agreed to go through the gates of hell at my request. But if I treated them with contempt, they would run away from me at the first opportunity. And they would have done the right thing. If you behave on an equal footing with all followers and inspire them with the power of your vision, you will cope with seemingly insurmountable obstacles. I realized this when the prince on paper ordered me to rebuild the wall of Kiyosu Castle. I was 21 years old when the powerful Yoshimoto, the leader of the Imagawa clan and the ruler of the province of the East Coast, invaded the prince's domain on paper. That year, fierce typhoons destroyed part of a 300-meter wall of stones and earth surrounding Kiyosu Castle, where our residence was located. If Yashimat's army had approached the castle before the wall was repaired, we could have been slaughtered like sheep. Prince Nabunaga allocated 500 people to restore the wall faster. However, time passed, and things moved slowly. According to the senior vassals, a spy sent by Yoshimoto bribed some of the workers to delay the restoration. The enraged prince summoned the head of construction to the meeting and demanded to explain the reasons for the delay in work. But he began to make unintelligible excuses and laid all the blame on his subordinates. Returning to the construction site, the boss bombarded the workers with accusations of stupidity and laziness. Under a hail of reproaches, they began to work even more slowly. Grabbing a stick, the boss began to chase the worker closest to him, shouting that he would teach him a lesson, but he turned out to be too agile, and the poor boss was soon out of breath. By that time, I had not even earned the rank of an infantryman. 
Despite some success in reducing fuel costs, I still continued to be officially considered a simple servant. Therefore, I was not allowed to participate in solving management problems, let alone express my opinion on strategic issues. However, unofficially, I was determined to do everything in my power to help the prince on Banaga, unite Japan and put an end to a century of wars. Prince Nobunaga rode his stallion along the rampart surrounding the wall to the sound of hammers in the air, watching the progress of construction work. The workers barely moving through the forests caused him a fit of rage. The curse. They didn't even do a fourth part of the work. As if it wouldn't come out sideways for us, especially in such turbulent times, I muttered to myself. With a wall like ours, Yoshimoto will be able to capture the castle even tomorrow. What did you just say, monkey? Prince Nobunaga asked. I jumped forward and bowed low, expecting a severe reprimand. At that time, I often did not have time to keep my mouth shut in time. Come on, repeat it, Prince Nobunaga ordered. Apologizing for my audacity, I repeated my words, and then expressed my thoughts on how best to restore the wall. Great things, I said, are never accomplished without spiritual uplift. And instead of threatening people with punishment, maybe it's worth giving the workers a break, giving them a good meal and drink, and in addition to the reduced payment, promising a bonus for early completion of work. So you think you can command better? Prince Nabunaga muttered. I wonder how you'll do it. Well, in any case, it won't get any worse. We will try your approach for three days, and if you fail, then the stick of the master will be the easiest punishment for you. He signaled that the conversation was over, spurred his horse and left the castle. I broke out in a cold sweat. Cheekily advising my employer how to finish the job faster, I was putting my fate on the line. The failure of the venture threatened me with at least punishment with sticks, or even something worse. In the past, decisive action has benefited me. Will it happen again? When I returned to my apartment, I spent the whole night thinking about the task assigned to me. In the end, armed with a brush and paper, I drew up a detailed plan for the reconstruction of the wall and figured out how to inspire uninitiated workers. The next day, all 500 workers gathered at the wall. Accustomed to hard work, they had seen a lot of difficulties in life and were not distinguished by grace of manners. It was clear from the sullen expression on their faces that they were expecting another reprimand for the delay in work. The dismissal of the construction supervisor and the appointment of this skinny servant Hyde Yoshi in his place only aggravated their despondency. Why the hell was this guy put in charge of us? The hard workers talked among themselves, showing obvious dissatisfaction. Prince Nabunaga gave me only three days to complete the work. But I devoted the whole first day to only two things, familiarizing people with the plan of upcoming work and organizing a feast for the whole team. During the briefing, I paid special attention to the reasons for the rush to restore the wall. You all know what dangerous times we live in. I shouted, standing on a makeshift platform. Despite my small stature, I know how to make you heard. The news that we have collapsed one wall and part of the stone rampart, no doubt, has already reached the enemy's ears. If we were attacked today, we would not be able to defend the fortress. And everyone in Kyosu, including you and your families, would be doomed to certain death. That's why we have to finish these works as soon as possible. I pinned a map of the fortress to two pillars and explained in detail how the work would be carried out. To speed up the process, I divided 500 workers into 10 teams that had to compete with each other. Prince Nabunaga will pay a bonus of 500 copper coins to each member of the brigade that will work the fastest, in addition to the established daily wage, I announced. In addition to the speed of work, its quality will be evaluated. Careless work will be equated with the actions of an enemy spy and punished with appropriate punishment. At my signal, a group of infantrymen brought out a heavy chest filled with copper coins and perched it on a wooden barrel. What about this one? I shouted, thrusting my hands into the chest and letting the ringing stream of coins fall back through my fingers. Who wants to earn the award? A buzz of excitement swept through the crowd of workers. 
I know how hard you've worked, so you can rest for the rest of the day, I continued. Prince Nabunaga has allocated a lot of food and drink, so fill your stomachs. These words were greeted with cheers and allowed the briefing to be completed in an atmosphere of general enthusiasm. And although it was barely past noon, I ordered the celebration to begin and began walking among the workers, most of whom barely reached the shoulder, encouraging them to eat and drink as much as they liked. From that moment on, they began to perceive me in a new light. Until this morning, the workers considered me just a servant of the prince on paper. But now they saw me as a leader who put himself on a par with them, without trying to emphasize his superiority. Their previous boss only scolded, gave orders and threatened punishment. Unlike him, I did not spare the time to clearly explain the purpose of the work and outline the action plan in detail. I treated these people as equals and believed that they deserved explanations, as well as additional remuneration for a job well done. If a leader wants to inspire people to achieve a goal, he must draw them a picture of his vision. The rest of the day we did nothing but drink, laugh and sing. I chatted with the workers, pouring them sake, offering them food and urging them to give all their strength to tomorrow's work. While filling their cups, I started conversations on the topic of betrayal several times, trying to speak loudly so that everyone could hear. Prince Nabunaga is well aware that spies have infiltrated Kiyosu Castle. If you work hard, he will forgive your sins. But those who shirk their jobs will pay with their heads, like the enemies of the Oda clan. Despite the fact that the workers' heads were clouded with hops, they understood the meaning of these words well. I am proud of my ability to lead teams of workers. Without realizing it, bosses often look down on their subordinates and constantly remind them of their superiority. This attitude feeds a sense of resentment and generates a negative backlash. I was a demanding leader for my workers, but I never tried to put myself above them. Instead, I lived with them soul to soul. When the workers showed up at the construction site the next morning, I was already standing next to a wooden chest filled with coins. The award is waiting for the winners. Get to work now. I called loudly. What happened next surprised even me. Without wasting a minute, people took up the task together with great enthusiasm. The work began to boil. The construction site looked more like a sports arena than a place of monotonous hard work. Each person focused on fulfilling their duties. Dressed in a simple work dress, I moved from one brigade to another, urging the workers to put even more effort. Thanks to their dedicated efforts, we completed the restoration of the fortifications in just three days, including a day spent celebrating. After the repair of the wall was successfully completed, I distributed the prize money to the members of the winning team and personally thanked each of them. Returning to the castle and seeing that the restoration work was completed, Prince Nabunaga could not believe his eyes. He looked at me, and a rare smile lit up his face. Good job, monkey. Delighted with the praise, I bowed. It was clear to me that he. He appreciated my talents and thought. Hideyoshir is a person who can do any job. Having distinguished myself as the head of construction, I was finally elevated to the rank of an infantryman. I managed to take the first step on the way to the heights of leadership. Have you understood the secret of winning loyal supporters? Be a leader, not a boss. Expand the network of personal acquaintances on an uncultivated field, nothing grows. The strongest oak turns into dust if the earth does not feed it with its juices. Those with whom you have to deal on the way to the heights of leadership, from the last infantryman to a powerful official, are the soil on which your career blooms or withers and dies. Improve your relationships with the people you meet along the way, and they will help you. I realized the importance of personal connections during the construction of Fort Tsunamata. I was unable to keep my mouth shut again but this time if I failed, I would have to lose it along with my head. In 1566th year, Prince Nabunaga went to war on the neighboring province of Mino, but faced desperate resistance. He decided that the only way to succeed was to build a fortress in Sunamat. The village of Sonomata was located on the border of the province of Accident and Mina, 
in a swampy area where three rivers merge. It was the perfect place from where to launch an attack on Mina province. The only difficulty was that it was in enemy territory. Prince Nabuniga twice ordered his generals to build a fortress, and twice they failed. Fighting off enemy attacks, they lost so many people that the ground around the construction site turned red with blood. When the prince gathered his vassals on paper and announced that he was going to make a third attempt, there were no people willing to carry out this intention. Such indecision did not please the prince. We have to build a fortress in Sunamat, thundered on the papers. Is there really no one among you who is ready to take on such an important task? What happened to you? Will no one take a step forward? No one moved. This infuriated the prince. Damn it! Cowards! And you dare to call yourself the people of Ode? And then I couldn't resist. I'm ready to do it, my lord. Prince Nabuniga turned sharply to look at me. You've proven yourself well before, monkey. But then there were no arrows whistling over your head. This time it will be different. My answer was determined. I understand everything, my lord. I will be able to complete this task and will not let you down. Fortunately, in my youth I had the opportunity to visit Sunamat many times, and this area was familiar to me. Sometimes I had nothing better to do than evaluate its strategic capabilities, although, of course, I could not have expected that I would have to build a fortress there. And now, at the age of thirty, I have received the most difficult task and the most wonderful opportunity to distinguish myself in my career. First of all, I sent scouts to the castle and to the Bayama clan of the site to monitor the enemy's movements and distract the attention of his generals from Sonomata. Then I started searching. Professional loggers for harvesting logs, boatmen for transporting planks down the river, carpenters and foremen, as well as blacksmiths for making tools. The key condition for the rapid construction of the fortress, I reasoned, was careful planning and division of labor, the early manufacture of individual parts for subsequent assembly at lightning speed. This required skilled workers of various professions. Therefore, I planned to entrust specialized teams with the manufacture of individual structural elements, and then I thought to bring everyone together for final installation. To speed up the process and quickly erect the frame of the fortification, we cut down the forest on the surrounding hills. At that time, the method of assembling structures from pre-prepared elements was something unheard of. As soon as I started drawing up a plan, I realized that there would not be enough people to carry out work of this scale. And this situation helped me to discover one of the main advantages in myself. Back in the days of vagrancy, when I had to deal with both skilled craftsmen and representatives of various strata of the population, I managed to acquire an extensive circle of friends and acquaintances. One of my friends, in a box, the leader of the famous robber gang, was well acquainted with the dark side of life. When I didn't have a penny to my name, he took me on as an apprentice for a while. This trade was hardly what my mother wanted, but I stayed for a short time, because I was going to become a noble samurai and take a high position in society. However, now the friendships I have managed to establish with this man and other members of his gang have proved invaluable. He and his followers were able to bring about 2,000 builders who helped us build a fortification in Sunamat. Thanks to such a wide circle of acquaintances, the construction of the fortress was completed in September 1566 year. According to legend, I built it in a day. It's completely absurd. The work took six weeks. Nevertheless, in those days, the implementation of such a large project in such a short time seemed unthinkable. Prince Nabuniga appreciated my achievement by elevating me to the rank of general and entrusting me to command a detachment of 3,000 soldiers. I returned to Kisu's castle in triumph, but I never forgot about the humble beginning of my rise, as well as about those who helped me along the way and thanks to whom success became possible. Even after joining the Oda clan, I continued to strengthen ties with friends of the past years. In addition, he tried to treat everyone kindly, constantly looking for and encouraging good qualities in people. That's why every time I needed help, people were ready to give it to me. Along the way, I learned an important secret. 
It's always easier to get to know people after you've had a cup or two of sake with them. As soon as I heard that a party was planned somewhere, I made every effort to participate in it. Some people thought I was a sycophant, but most people treated me with sincere warmth. If you intend to acquire devoted followers, master the secret of connections, increase your most valuable capital. Expand your personal dating network. Prepare carefully, act decisively. No matter who you lead, builders or soldiers, every impossible task requires two things, a thorough study of the problem facing you and decisive action. People who think I'm reckless and impulsive don't notice how carefully I prepare these decisive actions. During the war, I always try to study the enemy, to find out his strengths and weaknesses. Only after a thorough, comprehensive analysis of the situation, I make a detailed plan to strike at the enemy. Besides, I don't forget the lessons of the past. For example, when I became a general, I spent two years besieging Mickey's castle, because the defenders of the fortress had supplies of provisions, water, and other necessary things. This experience was an important lesson for me and served me well later, when Prince Nabunaga ordered me to clear Tadori Castle of the people of the Mori clan. In the spring of 1581, before giving the order to the troops to begin the siege, I sent young and intelligent merchants to the vicinity of Tadori province with the task of buying as much rice as possible at unusually high prices. When the commanders of the enemy forces stationed in Tadori castle became aware of the incredibly high price given in the city for rice, they began to sell their own supplies. Greed prevented them from thinking about why non-resident merchants suddenly began to pay such fabulous money for rice. After that, I surrounded Tadori Castle with a ring of 20,000 soldiers. We built a 12-kilometer line of palisades, trenches and ramparts, through which even a mouse could not slip. On the upper platforms, erected every thousand steps of three-tiered towers, we burned signal lights. We blocked the river surrounding the castle with piles to disrupt boat crossings. Enemy reinforcements tried to help their comrades, but our naval forces blocked the entire northern coast, leaving the fortress in complete isolation. Totori's defenders were doomed. They had to eat grass, fallen horses and, eventually, the meat of dead soldiers. We didn't have to wait two long years for the surrender. Instead of mindlessly destroying enemies, I prefer to defeat them by cunning, inventing tricks and trying to put them in a position where they are forced to agree to negotiations and accept my terms. That's what I did in Tator. I use force in extreme cases when one trick is not enough, but I always try not to shed blood in vain. If a person relies only on a sword and a spear, it means that he has a strong hand, but a weak mind. Besides, I've never reveled in triumph. Instead of sticking out my chest, I was looking for ways to ease the suffering. A successful attempt to buy up food supplies in Tota forced not only our enemies to starve, but also local peasants. Immediately after taking the castle, I distributed more than 50,000 kilograms of food to the starving. I am not a supporter of cruelty. In addition, the distributed food could ensure the loyalty of the local population. If I stormed the fortress using brute force and not trying to plan every step carefully, such a strategy would only increase the number of casualties on both sides. In trade, as in war, wise leaders apply the secret of strategy. Prepare carefully, act decisively. Turn weaknesses into strengths Both leaders and followers should be aware of their weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Your success depends on it, as it happened to me during the siege of Takamatsu Castle. In the year 1582, Prince Nabunaga ordered me to take Takamatsu Castle. The fortress was defended by 5,000 samurai of the Shimizu clan under the command of Prince Minaharu, while we had 20,000 soldiers. It seemed to me that an easy victory was waiting for us. However, Minaharu's resolute refusal to negotiate surrender worried me. Have I overlooked a crucial detail? I reluctantly ordered the assault and soon discovered the reason for my concern. My soldiers were stuck in a swampy area, and desperate fighters, municars inflicted heavy losses on them. 
our first attempt to take the fortress turned into a disaster. Stunned by this unexpected failure, I spent the whole night analyzing the situation, trying to find a way to victory with the help of strategic art, not brute force. I came to the conclusion that the location of Takamatsu Castle makes it almost impregnable. The fortress was built on a plain just above sea level and surrounded by water and swamps. On one side it was protected by a river, on the other two there were lakes, and a large well-guarded moat with water blocked access to the fourth. The usual tactics proved useless. Suddenly it dawned on me. If Takamatsu owes his inaccessibility to water, then only water will help me master him. I realized that the unique defense system of the castle made it possible to apply a hitherto unheard of technique, flooding. I could turn the advantageous geographical location of the fortress into a problem for its defenders and an advantage for us. We started preparing for the water assault with the construction of a dam around the castle. It was a massive structure several meters high and three kilometers long. We managed to persuade the local peasants to cooperate by paying them a fee in copper coins and adding to this a fee in rice for each sandbag laid in the dam. Satisfied peasants got down to business and packed more than 600,000 sandbags for us. True to my favorite policy of bloodless conquests, I managed to turn the storming of the castle into an ordinary engineering project of earthworks. With the joint efforts of soldiers and peasants, this grandiose task was completed in two weeks. Having built a dam, we changed the direction of the river and flooded the surrounding lands, thereby turning Takamatsu Castle into an artificial lake. After the water flooded the base of the castle and the defenders lost the opportunity to receive food and reinforcements, they did not have to wait long for the surrender. I sent a message to the prince on Banaga, offering to come and reap the laurels of victory. Experienced leaders skillfully use the secret of inversion. Turn disadvantages into advantages. Dear listeners, write down what other books you would like to listen to in audio format. Thank you for your likes and comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We wish you all the best.